My name is Vince Carson. I am a pediatric neurologist at the Clinic for Special Children, a small nonprofit clinic in Strasburg, Pennsylvania, serving children and adults with rare genetic disorders from the Amish and Mennonite communities. I would like to share a story with you about one of my patients from the old order Mennonite community named Ruth. When Ruth was three months old, she started having seizures. A seizure is an electrical storm in the brain caused by excessive firing of brain cells. When Ruth would have a seizure, she would flex her neck and extend her arms and legs repeatedly. She was seen by her local neurologist, and because she was having multiple unprovoked seizures, she was diagnosed with epilepsy and started on medication. Unfortunately, her seizures did not improve. When she was 21 months old, she came to see me at the clinic for special children. She was having dozens of seizures every day, and her development was regressing. The family was desperate for help. Per the Epilepsy Foundation, one in 26 people will develop epilepsy during their lifetime. Historically, Epilepsy has been categorized into different groups based on seizure characteristics, such as age when seizures first start, what the seizures look like, and changes in brain waves and structure. This approach enabled epilepsy to be studied more systematically, leading to improved treatment strategies and a better understanding of prognosis. We still use this tried and true strategy to treat seizures to this day. However, the problem with this approach is that two different disorders may result in seizures with very similar characteristics and appear to be the same disorder on the surface. This is especially the case with genetic disorders, which account for at least half of all cases of epilepsy. Now, before I go any further, I would like to provide you with a brief genetics primer. Every cell in your body contains deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. You can think of your DNA as a giant recipe book. In this giant recipe book, there are 20,000 recipes, or genes as we call them in genetics. Just like a recipe tells you how to make a cake, a gene tells your cells how to make a protein. And proteins are the workers of the cell. If there is a misspelling in the recipe that is particularly problematic, too much flour, not enough sugar, then the cake might not turn out right. Similarly, if there is a misspelling in a gene, a genetic variant, then the protein might not turn out right, resulting in a dysfunctional protein, which could potentially lead to a disorder, such as epilepsy. In the last 10 years, our knowledge of genetics has grown exponentially. Due to next generation sequencing, sequencing technologies, we can now rapidly sequence the entire genome. In addition, the cost of genetic testing has decreased significantly from about $10,000 per human genome in 2010 to approximately $1,000 currently. As a result, it is now possible to use genetic testing in the clinic to uncover the genetic causes of disease. This has the power to change the practice of medicine entirely. Instead of lumping patients together who have similar symptoms, we can group patients together who have the same genetic diagnosis. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In 2016, our clinic team discovered through whole exome sequencing, sequencing of the protein coding part of the genome, that a genetic variant in the gene NPRL3 was the cause of epilepsy in a Mennonite family from Ohio. Since then, we discovered that this variant in NPRL3 is commonly present in Mennonites with epilepsy across the country. In fact, 
we trace this NPRL3 variant back to a single founding couple in 1727. Based on this information, our team was able to develop a rapid, low-cost genetic test for NPRL3. During Ruth's first visit, we performed this simple targeted test and diagnosed her with NPRL3-related epilepsy. Based on our experience treating other patients with the same genetic diagnosis, we started Ruth on a different medication regimen. She subsequently stopped having seizures and regained the skills that she previously lost. As you can imagine, the family was overjoyed. Now this case demonstrates the usefulness of genetic testing for epilepsy. But genetic testing is not limited to epilepsy. Genetic disorders can affect any organ of the body, and it's not un uncommon for more than one organ to be involved. Furthermore, genetic disorders are not limited to children. There are many genetic disorders that present later in life. At the clinic, we use genetic testing whenever we suspect a genetic cause in both children and adults. You may be wondering why use of genetic testing is not more widespread. One reason for this is that interpretation of genetic test results is difficult. We are at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding genetic test results. When we perform whole exome sequencing, we identify thousands of rare genetic variants in each person. Most of these variants are benign and part of the why, reason why each of us is unique. What we are looking for is the genetic variant that truly is disease-causing or pathogenic. It can be challenging to zero in on the pathogenic variant when testing individuals. In order to do this, we rely on crowdsourcing of genetic information through servers such as ClinVar. As more and more people get genetic testing, we learn more and more about the significance of each rare genetic variant. Thus, the landscape of genetics is constantly changing, requiring a team of knowledgeable scientists, physicians, and genetic counselors to accurately interpret genetic test results. So why is it important to find a genetic diagnosis? First and foremost, it provides patients and their families with answers. We are able to provide the patient with a name for their disorder and an explanation for their symptoms. It is the end of the diagnostic odyssey and the beginning of another journey, one to empowerment and healing. Patients and their families often become very knowledgeable about their genetic disorder and frequently join support groups which enables them to connect with other people with the same genetic diagnosis who truly know what they're going through. At-risk family members can get targeted genetic testing to see if they harbor the same genetic variant, which is helpful for family planning and other important life decisions. Additionally, in the medical community, we learn from each patient encounter. When we care for a patient with a rare genetic disorder, we learn from the experience. The patient becomes our teacher. We then share what we learn with other medical professionals through peer-reviewed publications, conferences, and direct communication. Over time, our collective knowledge grows, and these experiences inform care for the next patient with the same genetic disorder. This results in improved anticipatory guidance and personalized treatment plans. What should the patient expect in the future? Are there associated medical conditions that require routine monitoring? Which treatments work best? Are there interventions that should be avoided? This is essentially what we did with Ruth, which led to her dramatic improvement. Finally, grouping patients together based on genetic diagnosis enables us to perform research focused on understanding disease mechanisms. What protein is encoded by the gene? What is the role of the protein in the cell? 
what happens to the cell when the protein is absent or dysfunctional? How do these changes in the cell lead to the symptoms that the patient is experiencing? These questions and many others are key to the development of targeted treatments that work at the molecular level to rescue the cell from the disease state and restore normal function. Let me give you an example. Spinal muscular atrophy is a genetic disorder that causes progressive brain stem and spinal cord degeneration. It affects one in 10,000 newborns and is the most common genetic cause of death during infancy. Children with a severe form of spinal muscular atrophy typically present with muscle weakness by three months of age, progressing to respiratory failure and death by two years of age. It truly is a horrible disease. In 1995, scientists discovered that infants with spinal muscular atrophy have a deletion within the SMN1 gene, a missing paragraph in the recipe, resulting in diminished production of SMN protein. Since this protein is crucial to the survival of brainstem and spinal cord cells that control muscle movement, the motor neurons, the SMN1 deletion ultimately results in motor neuron death. This discovery enables scientists to focus their research on figuring out creative ways to increase SMN protein production in motor neurons. Fueled by the steadfast support of the spinal muscular atrophy community, scientists work tirelessly on this mission, culminating in the development of not one, not two, but three different FDA-approved treatments for spinal muscular atrophy. Two of these treatments, nusinersen and rizdaplam, work at the molecular level to enhance production of full-length SMN protein from an otherwise inefficient backup gene called SMN2. The third treatment, onosemnogene abaparvavec, works by using a virus to deliver an intact copy of the SMN1 gene to motor neurons. Let me say that again. <laughs> Scientists modified a virus, one that does not cause human disease, so that it can deliver and inject a functioning copy of the SMN1 gene into motor neurons, like a molecular syringe thereby enabling the motor neurons to make SMN protein, which is necessary for survival. This is gene therapy, the pinnacle of precision medicine. All three of these treatments, nusinersen, rizdaplam, and onosemnogene abaparvavec, have been shown to increase muscle strength and improve survival in children with spinal muscular atrophy. I have witnessed this firsthand. Since spinal muscular atrophy is more common in the Amish and Mennonite communities, we have been involved in research using all three of these treatments. In fact, the Clinic for Special Children was a site for the phase three clinical trial using onosemnogene abaparvavec gene therapy to treat newborns with spinal muscular atrophy. The infants were treated with a one-time intravenous infusion of the gene therapy on the pediatrics floor at Penn Medicine Lancaster General Hospital. I have witnessed these children learn to sit independently and even walk on their own, still alive and doing well several years after this one-time treatment, which is miraculous considering that these same children have siblings that died by six months of age from this heartbreaking disease. Indeed, these treatments have changed the disease trajectory of spinal muscular atrophy entirely, providing hope to patients and their families for the first time. In addition, we now know that early treatment of spinal muscular atrophy leads to better outcomes. Therefore, it is important to diagnose infants as early as possible, before the onset of symptoms. 
For this reason, spinal muscular atrophy was added to the Pennsylvania newborn screen in 2019, which tests for the SMN1 deletion. Thus, every newborn in Pennsylvania and over 30 other states is screened for spinal muscular atrophy using genetic testing, which allows affected infants to be identified and treated within the newborn period. To close, the spinal muscular atrophy story serves as an example for what is possible for other genetic disorders. The ultimate goal is to diagnose patients with genetic disorders before the onset of symptoms so that we can preemptively intervene with targeted treatments such as gene therapy and prevent patients from ever developing symptoms. This is the power of a genetic diagnosis, and this is the future of medicine. Thank you.